two, one. We are live now. Good evening, everyone. I, Vishal Kundani, on behalf of the West Zone, I welcome you all to the West Zone IOA CME Part One on spine, on topic non-surgical management of common spinal problems. Today we have a widespread faculty from across. West Zone and North Zone, and this combined CME between the West Zone IOA and North Zone IOA is meant to cater to problems related to non-surgical common day-to-day -day practice problems related to disc disorders and also tuberculosis in the part two. May I take this opportunity to welcome the President West Zone, Dr. Ajit Shinde sir, to please deliver the welcome address, followed by the North Zone President, and then handing over of the academic session. Dr. Ajit Shinde. Thank you, Vishal. Respected dignitaries of IOA and my team members of West Zone IOA, Dr. Vikas Jain, Dr. Bandekar, Vice Presidents, and Secretary Dr. Navin Thakkar. President and Secretary of Maharashtra and Gujarat Orthopedic Association, Dr. Gadegune Sir and Dr. Narayan Kanne and Dr. Govin Purohit and Kamlesh Dev Muradi, and all respected faculty members. Good evening, happy Diwali, and welcome to the webinar of West Zone of IOA. I thank North Zone for their active participation in spite of short notice in this webinar. President Dr. Sanjeev Gupta and Secretary Dr. Harpal Singh Saini. In the past two months, we have had interested topics and discussion regarding various complex injuries and their operative management principles. Today, we will be discussing spine problems and how to manage them non-operatively. We have interesting topic and eminent faculty to discuss prolapse intervertebral disc and tuberculosis of spine. We have with us today, Dr. Sai Raut, Dr. Ankur Nanda, Dr. Abhijit Pawar, Dr. Sarvadeep Datta, Dr. Privan Patel, Dr. Ankit Patel as a panelist, while my very near and dear friends, Dr. Vishal, Dr. Shailesh, and Dr. Dheeraj will be moderating the session, and whom I thank for all the effort to conduct this webinar. All are experienced and expert in this field, and I'm sure there will be interesting, fruitful discussion. Finally, I thank Team Ortho TV, Dr. Ashok Sham and Dr. Neeraj Bislani for their support. Thank you everyone for your patient hearing. Over to Vishal. Vishal is mute. So, sir, thank you very much. So, this is one of the first webinar of for spine through West Zone Society. Uh, and this society is formed by uh, various neighboring states uh, in West, Gujarat, Goa, and uh, Maharashtra. Uh, the, this uh, Today's topic is on non-surgical management of common spine problem. Uh, and this is one of the, uh, we usually discuss about the surgical uh, uh, problems in spine and the non-surgical part, which is the crux and the majority of uh, 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 the treatment part has been not been discussed uh, routinely. So I thank uh, Dr. Ajit Shinde to decide on this uh, uh, topic and uh, we'll proceed on to our, uh, 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 our lecture uh, uh, from, I will call uh, Dr. Sai Raut to present a case uh, on uh, PIVD, Dilemma and Options in Management. Over to Dr. Sai. Thank you so much, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be showing two cases of prolapse intervertebral disc and from there we'll just have a discussion with the panelists now. So first case is about a 23 year old girl who has complained of left leg radiating pain, which is both the legs basically left is more than right and it's been there since four months. Her ADL activity of daily living is affected. So all conservative uh, trials have been failed. Her SLR on the left side is 40 degrees and on the right side is 60 degrees. Her left side ankle dorsiflexion is grade 4 by 5. Her sensations are reduced over L4 and L5 dermatomes. Going to the X-rays, she has... Uh, we did a flexion extend x-ray, but we didn't find any uh, instability in this case. Going yeah, on to... Uh, uh, Sai, just want to check why. what was the reason for you to check uh, uh, at day one? Sorry, sir. 
uh, so, what was the reason for doing collection extension? So it's been four months, you sir. You wanted to assess. You wanted Correct. to assess the instability. Instability. It's been four months. The pain is there, okay. and she also okay. has some component of back pain also. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So we move on, and we did an MRI. Which MRI sagittal section shows a L3, 4, and L4, 5 disc. And on axial cut, we see a L3, 4, and L4, 5, a central disc. And uh, uh, we see that uh, the both levels are uh, uh, disc and the bilateral, the nerve roots are compromised. So what will be the further plan from here? If the patient has been four months uh, conservative treated, should we con try conservative method? Should we do a root block? Should we do a root block for a diagnostic purpose or a treatment part? Or we go ahead with the surgeries? Surgery for one level or both the levels? So, uh, Sai, uh, please go again to the MRI and tell uh, us symptoms in brief. So she has uh, symptoms of left leg pain more than right leg pain. Her left leg pain is like uh, 100% and right leg pain is like 40% and it's there since four months. This is an MRI. Okay. And uh, what's the dermatomal pattern of the pain? 4-5 dermatome. So both dermatomal pains? So, so yes, yes, yes. It's yes. going middle, middle side of the ankle as well as lateral side of my ankle. Correct, correct. And her sensations okay. are also reduced over L4 and L5 dermatomes. Okay, okay, great. And it looks stable on dynamic view. Correct. And how long these symptoms are there? It's four months now. Okay, and you have tried conservative already? Correct. Okay. What exactly conservative means? What did you do in conservative treatment? What all things so, you normally do? Uh, so, patient had come to us. She was already uh, taking a... She was there on bed rest for a few weeks, two weeks first. And uh, later on, which when the pain was less, she started with the exercises. So she was given some uh, physiotherapy exercises and uh, uh, obviously analgesics and all uh, medicines were started. After which she had come to us now four months since the symptoms. Right. Okay. Right. I just want to ask uh, all, all the panelists, how many of you really believe in uh, a bed rest for three to four weeks, giving traction for 10 to 15 days? Dheeraj? Uh, so, uh, bed rest, uh, uh, I try to avoid bed rest for longer time. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, as we, I think most of us do the same. Uh, yes. we, we try to uh, mobilize the patient, even with pain, uh, as per the pain, uh, let him uh, move out of bed. <clears throat> for initial excruciating pain, initial few days, I ask the patient to be bedridden for at least 20 <laughs> hours a day, in whichever position he feels uh, okay. Okay, and after the patient is uh, downgrading and he is able to sit and stand, I, I, I ask him uh, to resume his day-to-day -day activity. I am not a, 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 a very good, I'm not, uh, I have almost stopped uh, putting patient on tractions or absolute uh, long uh, bed rest for 3-3 three, three weeks. Okay, yes, Abhijit, what is your protocol for uh, such patients? Yeah, she's a young patient, 23-year-old female. Uh, so initially my protocol and initial stages is definitely bed rest with bath bathroom privileges i tell them of three weeks of rest bathroom privileges and and then medications analgesics and um, gabaneuron or pregabalin and then start physiotherapy as well once the pain subsides uh, after a week okay after so. three weeks of conservative management i tell them to be a little active and start uh, mckenzie pattern exercises and see how they progress Okay, uh, how much you believe in uh, this tense and uh, interferential treatment, the physiotherapy? Uh, I mean, I leave it to the physiotherapist. I'm not a big believer of tense and IFT. But if the patient, sometimes it gives a psychological health, uh, benefit to the patient. So if they say it's helping them, then I said, okay, continue. But I think the mainstay of treatment is uh, uh, exercises. Uh, uh, and hot fermentation, if they can you uh, do at home itself. Correct. So there are a lot of uh, different studies. Uh, as you see, there are two different surgeons, two senior surgeons are talking. One is not giving much of rest and one is telling three weeks of rest. Basically, this is a thing which is related to the pain pattern. And uh, nowadays, uh, with uh, advancement and people don't want to be really in bed. Initially, when there was no MRI, we used to tell patients four to six weeks of rest and traction and things like that. But when we know now that this is a disc, which is a culprit, we can actually reduce that amount of uh, rest, complete rest, and patient can do some basic activities. Uh, again, there are two schools of thought in this. One uh, about physiotherapy. Some, some uh, surgeons prefer to 
do uh, exercises some of them prefer to do only uh, ift and pens and lot of literature is coming up and they say in acute phase if you tell the patient to do physiotherapy and exercises there are chances that will worsen your symptoms are high so that is uh, one consensus what do, what is your opinion on this dheeraj sorry i missed your question no uh, because in acute phase if you ask the patient to do exercises the okay. chances of him worsening are high that is what lot of papers are coming about right right so so that's what uh, i am not uh, very pro so so as per the pain tolerance i have already, already told you maybe ift and tens can be given if you know okay, that can give a localized uh, pain relief so probably, if the patient is indoor ift and tens becomes one of the option otherwise Correct. in, in uh, if patient is at home we 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 see this patient on opd basis Okay. Yeah, yeah. Don't like yeah. to admit this patient for tens and IFT. They have, again have to travel. So they have to travel. Is, yeah. Another, another very. Uh, so it's not practical for patient to travel for IFT, and that doesn't have any significant role in pain. If pain relief. Pain yeah. Tone, and then we have to try a conservative treatment. Then uh, in on the side of bed, if everything is available, that's fine. And uh, I want to ask you about fermentation, Dheeraj. A lot of people say, "Yeah, if it is." winter i give hot fermentation and if it is summer i give cold fermentation what is your take on it i uh, sorry i don't have a limited knowledge about this abhijit no i i mean i prefer hot fermentation but if the patient likes uh, cold fermentation i don't have any specific uh, seasonal preference i think it's whatever okay. patient likes yeah because but, you know, a lot of patients feel better with different you know because there is no clear cut evidence or literature on this and patient keeps asking us ki whether i should do that. and i want to ask you one more important thing in this the belief of lumbar belt both of you i want to ask abhijit and dheeraj whether be, uh, lumbar belt gives pain relief uh, so so my answer will be same what abhijit answered so uh, if many patients feel uh, better after belts so see lumbar belt i don't think uh, has a significant role uh, in spine stabilization okay so i i am not a very strong believer of lumbar belt but many times patient feels some support uh, after lumbar belt so i am okay for using lumbar belt for couple of days but if this patient is seen even after months of surgery or of, or after conservative treatment with belt walking with uh, in my opd with a belt i am not very much comfortable so i strictly tell them don't use uh, this belt this belt is uh, 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 causing atrophy of your muscles and uh, you should be avoided uh, for long term correct Yeah. and chronic repetitive use of belt for long is uh, show is showing the evidence of atrophy as you rightly said but short term people say that it gives that vasodilation for the lumbar muscles and patient feels better pain relieved and they feel better and the sense of stabilized spine they feel that i am stable now yes and uh, maybe that's all psychological but there is no clear cut evidence and uh, normally in my practice if the patient is asking for it i never tell him not to use but i personally do not prefer a belt in uh, a disc problem right right okay okay so what is uh, the question is uh, conservative treatment is already done by sai and now he is at dilemma what should we do so, uh, so right now i can see the mri both the level there is a broad based disc bulge and pressing both the nerve roots but the symptomatic side is uh, pressing more left side on actual curve we can see the side right and the other thoda dheera i think there is a uh, sound is a problem so i think he is want to try to tell us that uh, the symptom is more on the left side whereas uh, <clears throat> the mri has this clear evidence that it's a central disc no i think uh, uh, the patient is not with a major deficit no uh, MRI, it's great it's not. no not patient is only four of uh, four okay so i think my my our plan will be still considering because she is 23 i will still consider giving her a pain block facet plus foraminal block i will consider in this particular case and i will just monitor how much she really improves let's know what abhijit feels yeah i think she has i will slightly differ here because i you know it's been 4 months uh, she has tried conservative management she has a uh, little weakness on the left side 
young female at the l3 4 level i see an explosion of the disc um uh, i would like to offer surgical management uh, with microendoscopy de decompression at l3 4 l l4 5 uh, i think it's still okay so i think l3 4 is the main culprit in my opinion okay that's that's uh, fair enough abhi because uh, every uh, one will have a different way of approaching Correct. the patient yeah and, uh, everyone is right in that context yes. you want to also go for a conservative we, we, yes Sorry. I think that sir, his voice is not. Uh, we are not able to get. Dila, your voice is not clear. Sir, so you are trying to have a conservative trial uh, to this patient because you somewhere feel that uh, if we go for operative management, we'll have to do both levels. That is the also reason. No, no. I think uh, just because the age, you know, uh, if uh, she is twenty-three, and if we see when uh, we, we, I think someone's uh, both the phones are on. I think uh, either uh, there is a disturbance. Someone has opened mobile as well as laptop. I think. Can you unmute, unmute everyone? Can we mute everyone? Anyone is the admin? Or to TV? Lot of disturbance is coming. Yeah, I think Doctor Dheeraj's uh, voice is a little disturbing. So, yeah, can you mute him and once and see? Uh -huh. Yeah, we can just check. See, uh, see, surgery is the easiest thing which we can offer. You know, okay, it's not a challenge. So, surgery is the very easiest thing. Do any surgery, uh, minimal invasive, MED, endoscopic, open interlaminar, whatever approach you want, patient. That is that is said and done. Every one of us we know. Challenge is how to treat this patient without surgery, and that is where it is. You know, okay. Uh, and we have not done anything if we don't have the option of pain blocks i think then uh, you, you will offer that but if you really know you you believe that the blocks works then i think i have people who believe in pain block will do the pain block and i will say i will repeat the pain block also maybe after 6 to 8 weeks if the patient is getting that initial um, pain relief you know uh, this this is this is a settleable disc uh reasonably contained and if you give time this patient will settle and you will see at one one and a half year she will be doing dancing everything well there's a good chance we can treat this patient without surgery shinde okay. sir what is your take hey, you need to unmute sir yes yes i will also give a trial of conservative treatment in this case okay considering the Also, sir, this uh, symptoms are both right and left side. So you want to give both side blocks here? Yes, yes. Uh, I I will give both side block and both levels. Four aminal block, yes. And uh, you know, okay. See, if you don't, uh, option is clear. He, you are going for a surgery. But if you give and feel, if you get that, uh, you know, okay, at least a uh, pain score from uh, eight to nine uh, on ten to five to four. You are you are done. You know you you got that time. Slowly this will start, and we have seen a lot of patient with disappearing acts, especially in youngsters. Unless the patient is demanding and patient is not been able to walk three four minutes, terrible pain listed to any household chores, then yes. But otherwise, so, if the patient is active with this disc, I will not offer surgery. So both levels you want to give blocks? You are saying both level block, yeah. Yeah, and so because in India it's difficult. Yeah, because if you tell the patient that yeah, we will do one level again, again you come after three four weeks, it doesn't work. No, why I'm asking. Give... So why I'm asking you is because in future, if she needs some surgical management, do we need to identify the levels also? <laughs> Which level is? The... No, no, I think I, it's a very very important question, and what you're saying is right. If in future, if you really want to offer surgery, which level you will tackle? But if it gets better, my I am going with the mindset of not operating. Her. Therefore, I want to do both levels. If I am thinking of operating, then it's a totally different ball game. That's what I feel. Correct, correct, sir. So the take-home message is correct, yeah. and. Uh, So uh, we, we, yeah, you see, these, these are the cases where we have seen, you know, okay, very close friends, doctors. Uh, they don't want to get surgery done. Surgeons, 
they will try you every one of us have a experience of people coming with no no i don't want surgery do something and uh, you know ki even in covid time we who had because of the lockdowns and things it disappeared you know after some time so there is a good evidence that the acute discs have a good chance of uh, getting better but yes we have to monitor them regularly it should not happen that we are conserving and patient is developing foot weakness ankle weakness that's not on so we need to closely monitor these patients and uh, appropriate anti anti inflammatory medications and uh, physiotherapy is the key Interest one last question for this case yes. <clears throat> yeah so one last question for this case sir this uh, uh, some uh, patients or uh, doctors would prefer epidural for this what is your take on that sir <clears throat> i personally i used to do uh, last 15 16 years i am doing pain blocks and we have one of the large number of but uh, we used to do a oral epidural for blatantly for more patients in the past but uh, in last around 10 years we are very selective we give uh, foraminal or nerve root blocks and facetal blocks because the um, efficacy is better the pain relief is definitely better when you are selectively uh, blocking that particular area definitely I better for selectively uh, blocking that particular area and one okay. indication where you want to keep only facet block one indication where you want to keep only facet block um only facet block uh, also will work only facet block also for the patient in terms of the legs for the patient if the patient is with leg symptoms it's better to combine both foraminal plus facet block okay. yes abhi yes yes Vishal, you ask me something. Yeah, which block you will prefer? I would prefer transforaminal nerve block because her main symptoms are radicular pain. So uh, I would not give a facet block. Young female, uh, radic morely radicular symptoms. Okay. Uh, since she has bilateral symptoms, I will go on both sides at L three four on the left side and L four five on the right side. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Perfect. Should we move so on to the next case, Sai? Yes. Sir. Sai, you have another case to present. Yes, yes. One more, one more. Sir, what did you do? You have not told me. So, because sir, it was four months uh, old and uh, uh, patient wanted to get rid of it, so we did both levels uh, micro disc. Okay. So, in case two, we have a fifty-nine-year-old male who is a doctor by profession. He has left leg radiating pain since twelve days only. and he has a leg pain which is more than back pain but he has some back pain component his slr is 40 degrees his adl is severely affected his neurologically left ankle dorsiflexion is 3 by 5 so now we did his x rays again uh, but there was no instability and uh, we saw his mri which was sagittal and axial cuts which showed there is a left sided foraminal disc on the 4 5 level which is a up going cranially uh, migrated four five left sided disc so sir in such cases what would you like to do it's a 12 days old only and a foraminal is fresh a doctor which would yeah priyank patel i can see priyank hi priyank hi Hello. good evening everyone yeah hi priyank you have seen the case uh, yes the left sided symptoms with uh, ankle weakness or of grade 3 and radiculopathy correct and just 12 days on set so what you want to offer to this young fellow how, how bad is the weakness for this patient 3 by 5 3 by 5 by so so this 3 by 5 also so so this so this patient has got so a disc which is uh, extruded up migrated on the left side at the level of 4 5 uh, which matches five. with the uh, uh, which, which matches, matches with the, the yeah, clinical which, picture since the deficit is a acute onset there is a soft disc and the patient has uh, just 3 by 5 deficit i would initially try to conserve the patient by putting him on bed rest and starting him a short course of steroids there are so many questions asked by patients sir in 12 days of course asking about the neurology if to improve there will be so many questions because he is a doctor by profession how would you answer those questions sir like about the neurology would you guarantee him if the neurology will improve or do we have to go for you know some intervention before the neurology worsens so technically speaking uh, at this stage uh, being conservative and being aggressive means conservative and surgical options both would be actually right in this patient as uh, there is a neurology and neurology definitely gives uh, 
is a justified reason for surgery since the patient is a doctor you can take it, you can have that discussion with him and if he's intelligent under supervision you can try a conservative treatment which means admit him start injectable steroids watch the neurology every day if the neurology improves on steroid then you can proceed with the conservative treatment and, and if the patient does not improve then you can uh, go ahead and do the surgery okay, okay. So, last That's case sir uh i i just want to know from other panelists because grade 3 is also significant weakness for me I means i will i will uh, err towards a uh, 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 surgical side more because it's a grade 3 which is a, almost a very significant uh, if it was 4 and above that that sometime might be borderline but i don't know and how many of i you think i think uh, uh, in uh, in such situations uh, grade 3 uh, probably is like grade 3 4 and in acute phase because of pain patient can have uh, you know with yes, pain every, patient every. can have certain one one grade level you yes. can always uh, as a uh, priyank please give team from metri medications closely monitor and this is not a very large disc the exclusion is there but it's very small yeah and it is a soft disc you know it's more true. it's yeah. not a hard disc it's a very soft patient, disc yeah i think this patient is a good chance and we have a lot of patients who have improved with conservatism in 4 to 6 weeks time you know initially it appears in acute phase but as they proceed they definitely improve okay what is your experience uh, uh, shinde sir shinde sir also treats a lot of spines and we are associated for 8 10 years now are you there shinde sir yes yes i am here again i will prefer conservative treatment in this patient because uh, because of pain we really could not uh, assess the power of that limb correct right right good good so uh, good point yeah so what you did uh, tell me sir sai so oh, sir i tried uh, giving him a, like it was a foramenal disc and um, uh, he was in tremendous pain not able to you know move around and also i gave him a root block Okay. that is transformational root block first and uh, then um, and uh, we waited and in 3 or 4 weeks his symptoms resolved super super patient got better better yeah oh, perfect excellent well done yes i think it time to move on because we are running short of time today we have to be on time we invite the next speaker our next speaker is uh, dr neeraj uh, gupta so dr nag mensa dr neeraj gupta will be present nag mensa he is talking about the game la are we on uh, post operative the leg pains uh, uh, remain and why why this happened he just will be uh, telling us on this neeraj 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 okay we can go with the next one injection techniques as a uh, uh abhijit uh, we were discussing so let's know from abhijit what yes, are the techniques which he offers right can you see my screen uh, dr shailesh yeah yeah okay so i'm just going to share about the conservative management yeah. can you hear me yeah 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 all right okay can you see me as well right yeah okay so inject spinal injection techniques for uh, mostly lumbar spine and common cervical pathologies Uh, so uh, we have already seen the spine anatomy when sai discussed uh, this is a normal uh, mri scan which we see in the practice uh, so here you can see the healthy disc l at all the levels uh, you can see the ligamentum flavum and the width of the csf and this is how the neural foramen looks like in the mri uh, the pedicle and and the l3 nerve root uh, just for uh, our information so what causes pain i mean the radicular pain uh, is usually caused by either disc herniation causing compression of the nerve or morphological changes in the disc changes uh, in the disc uh, so as you see here um, there is a disc herniation or degeneration and spondylolisthesis leading to nerve compression and radicular pain and the pathophysiology here remains the same there is mechanical deformation of the intervertebral disc or the nucleus pulposus induces effects that lead to neurotoxicity and radicular pain so all these pain generators are located in the foramen mostly the disc 
Although nucleus pulpus is causing irritation of the nerve is the most common cause. Other factors like the ligamentum flavum or the facial arthropathy causing nerve compression is the other cause of uh, the radicular pain or sciatica pain. This is a typical example of a disc bulge seen on the MRI. Uh, we saw when Sai had shown, shown us protrusion and extrusion as well as asymmetrical disc bulge. So the, depending on the compression, the symptoms vary. And it's very important to know which side predominantly the patient has symptoms because that is the directional preference where you go ahead with your nerve block. Suppose the patient has extrusion on the extreme left side or left paracentral region, then your preference of nerve block is on the left uh, transformal region or the left-sided nerve roots. If it is uh, central multi-level stenosis, then your preference is epidural nerve block. So that's very important. So we saw this before. This is a broad uh, based disc herniation in a patient causing radicular symptoms. And on the contrary, this is a large X-ray disc at L5-S1 uh, causing radicular symptoms. So all these patients do have radicular symptoms. Uh, now, this is a classical example of a degenerative disc disease. You can see the disc space is narrowed. There's significant degeneration of the disc space at the L4-5 level as compared to L3-4, causing discogenic axial back pain. So now I'm going to show you a simple technique for transformal nerve block. This is, uh, I tend to do this uh, technique by myself uh, because I believe that doing it yourself, uh, you retain the patient towards you because he develops the bonding to, uh, with you. Even if you fail in this technique, um, the patient knows that we have tried your level best in conservative management. Uh, so usually the lumbar blocks, I do it by myself. Uh, so in the prone position, the levels are marked under C-arm. I use a long 18 centimeter long spinal needle and, and take a true AP and true lateral view. Uh, try to see the position of the iliac crest for the L5-S1 level, levels. Now the needle is passed at, at about 11 centimeters from the uh, midline at an angle of about 45 degrees towards the foraminal region. And the position is confirmed in the AP view and as well as in the lateral view. Once the position is confirmed, we inject a dye. Um, initially, I do a discogram in patients who have degeneration to see how much degeneration they have. Otherwise, if the patients have uh, only radicular pain, I would just obtain a, uh, a tracing of the nerve and not do a discogram. Patients who have the degenerative disc disease along with uh, radicular pain, I would do a discography as well. A discography helps in identifying whether the disc has undergone degeneration depending on how much extravasation of the dye occurs through the annular tears. So it's a diagnostic as well as uh, intradiscal steroid does help in uh, relief of pain in my opinion. Later on, I pull the needle a little outwards and identify the nerve dressing and then inject the nerve steroid around the nerve. If there is discogenic axial back pain, I would do about 1 ml of uh, local anesthesia along with steroid in the, the intradiscal region as well. Now, I firmly believe that as orthopedic surgeons, we are more comfortable with AP and lateral views. So I use AP and lateral views rather than the um, horse, uh, oblique views because I'm not comfortable with the oblique views. So I use AP and lateral views for my nerve blocks. Simple. Anybody can do it. And the technique is uh, gives a predictable relief of pain in patients with early onset radicular pain. Then if patients have facial arthropathy, you can do a facet arthrogram and for the fast uh, and with the needle and for the fast uh, and, and there's some disturbance here okay so identify the facets and inject around the facet joints by doing an arthrogram for discogenic pain uh, we do an intradiscal block as suggested before uh, we inject the needle in the disc space inject the dye uh, identify the degeneration and inject the steroid in the intradiscal region if the patient has severe discogenic pain and he wants to try conservative management and if he has failed trial of physiotherapy then comes the sacroiliac joint pain the sacroiliac joint is commonly involved in inflammatory arthropathies. So in these patients, uh, if the patient is not responding to medicines uh, or patients, nowadays patients who had fusion surgeries at the L5-S1 level or multiple fusions, they develop secondary sacroiliac joint arthritis. So if those patients don't respond to conservative treatment, we do offer them SI joint injections. I prefer the medial to lateral approach. Commonly employed, very easy technique. Anybody can um, who is familiar with the anatomy can do it. So do an arthrogram and inject the steroid along with local anesthesia technique. 
Now, lumbar stenosis, as we, dis as we discussed, multilevel stenosis or congenital stenosis or acquired lumbar stenosis, uh, you can do an epidural block. Uh, so you can go through the midline. I prefer to go through the transformal region as well because you can easily advance needle and pass the injection at multiple levels um, with the epidural block. So neck pain, uh, the neck pain, the similarly in the neck, you can see you can see radicular symptoms in patients with disc herniation or cervical spondylosis leading to axial back pain or facial arthropathy. So this technique also helps in patients who have tried physiotherapy and have failed uh, medications. We are very well versed with the anatomy of the facet joints and the uh, position of nerve uh, in the cervical spine. So I'm not going to go into this. This is a typical picture showing um, a distribution of uh, cervical facet joint pain. So advanced arthritis of facet joints can cause uh, uh, parascapular pain or trapezitis. So if the patient has failed uh, physiotherapy, then we can offer them um, facet joint blocks in the cervical spine. If the predominantly radicular pain is there, then I would prefer a transferminal injection in the cervical spine. Only precaution is in the cervical spine, you should avoid uh, depomedrol. Uh, you should use dexamethasone because the vertebral artery is closed. And if you inject the depomatol in the vertebral artery, there are chances there are some case reports of um, the vertebral artery uh, thrombosis. So in the cervical spine, I prefer dexamethasone rather than depomatol. It is safer even if you uh, if even if the injection goes intrathecal, uh, there is no adverse effect. Yes, we do use um, uh, uh, cardio safe uh, dye to confirm your positions and then inject, uh, but. Uh, particulate steroids are avoided in the cervical spine, preferably. Um, uh, the, the, the protocol is to do uh, dexamethasone injections here. Now, there are some advances nowadays, use of PRP in disc degeneration. Um, I have done in a couple of cases, but uh, there is some literature evidence to show that um, use of PRP does help in patients with degeneration, but my experience has been very limited. Um, uh, as literature advances, we'll have more uh, literature to support this technique. So these are the common techniques uh, for lumbar and cervical spine injections uh, for facetal problems, disc herniations and degenerative disc disease, as well as sacroiliac joint in conditions. Thank you. Very nice and uh, elaborative talk, Abhijit. A lot of things uh, we managed with this. As we all see a lot of patients with back and neck pain. And uh, we all yeah. see a lot of if someone's, uh, is my voice is clear? Is someone's, uh, is my voice clear? Yes, yeah. yes. Abhijit. We, we can hear. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Abhijit. Uh, we can hear. Yeah, excellent, excellent, excellent talk. Yeah, excellent talk. Uh, my question, I have a couple of questions for you. Yes. So, uh, first of all, you can assess uh, on yes. MRI uh, the degeneration in the disc. So, why a discography, how it helps, that is one. Second thing, uh, you are using uh, the transformational approach uh, just like an endoscopic, uh, like a putting like an endoscope. No? Going correct, the correct. So again, yes. what's, uh, what's the routine, uh, other techniques, uh, it is just a paramedian, just uh, I think three to four fingers uh, just against and hitting the uh, posterior wall uh, of the yeah. Yeah. See, with the transformational approach, you exactly enter the, and you can go in the intradiscal, epidural and transformational region at the same time. Okay. You know, that is the advantage, Dheeraj, because suppose a lot of patients, you see they have stenosis, they have um, degeneration, uh, and they have slip disc at the same time. Right. So with right. the transformational approach, you can address all the possible pain generators. With the technique you are describing, it's not uh, incorrect, but I feel that you can address only the radicular pain with that technique. And I'm not very comfortable with the horseshoe, you know, the uh, Scottish dog sign. I, I feel very jittery when I get in the OT and do an oblique x-ray. The technician doesn't know what exactly you want. AP and lateral, everybody is comfortable. It's very easy, predictable, and you can address all the pen genitals, disc, foramen, and epidural. You can inject the steroid all that to all three locations comfortably. Right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So regarding my first question, you mentioned about the degeneration of disc. Uh, so why not just uh, follow the MRI and uh, assess the degeneration? Why you need extra information or what extra information uh, discography provides which MRI? So the discography, you know, uh, See, it is documentation purpose to, uh, in my opinion, because since you already placed the needle, 
and we want to show it to the patient that we have injected intradiscal steroid no so i'd easily take to take some pictures and show it to the patient ki this is what we have done Right. So unless and until the steroid is not seen, if you just give a steroid, so they'll see that something was given or not given. So it's a documented thing that okay, we had injected the dye in the steroid disc, and it's a documentation that you have tried your level best. Right. right. So even if it fails, that we can say okay, it's failed, but we have tried our level best. So that's the purpose. Okay. And you expect any uh, some of the uh, steroids coming out of the annulus, and the annulus fibers also get uh, uh, some uh, anti effect. Yeah, it can come out. Yeah, that's okay. I mean, no, I don't think it causes any side effects. I'd... Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Great. Any questions from uh, Priyam? No, I think everything here has been covered. Yes. Uh, in... uh, another question: How how does PRP acts? Uh, you can tell us in brief. Uh, and whether you have some experience with PRP? No, in our uh, hospital, some pain management guys are doing the PRP technique. i tried in couple of patients but i didn't see significant benefit okay. i mean prp is working well in tendinopathies like tennis elbows and um, heel pains and plantar fasciitis the similar uh, logic here uh, you know uh, it acts you know it suppresses the uh, inflammation uh, initially it causes inflammation followed by suppression okay but in couple of patients i tried i was not very convinced so i, I was little jittery of using it again and again around the nerves Right. but there is some literature in supporting the prp it is little expensive technique as well so i am little i am not a little convinced with the prp approach but there are some pain management doctors in our hospital doing it regularly okay there are some other reports also about tna alpha inhibitor something like that yeah like with the prp uh, or as a, as alone also no i you uh, don't have it. I, i don't know have any knowledge about it okay okay ठीक ठीक इरज कैन आई ऐड समथिंग या या प्लीज सो देयर आर एक्चुअली सेवरल सो मेनी डिफरेंट टेक्निक्स एंड डिफरेंट मेडिकेशंस व्हिच आर बीइंग यूज्ड फॉर दीस पेन मैनेजमेंट प्रोसीजर्स ऑफ ऑल द डिफरेंट टेक्निक्स लाइक पीआरपी देन ओजोन इंजेक्शंस एंड द टीएनएफ अल्फा इनहिबिटर्स द द मोस्ट प्रूवन वन इज स्टेरॉइड एवरीथिंग एल्स हैज गॉट अ मिक्स बैग ऑफ लिटरेचर सो यू हैव गुड पेपर्स एंड यू हैव बैड पेपर्स so as a take home i think steroids is the thing that absolutely works and that should be the the first thing to go to yes perfect. also i would i will uh, again uh, because one thing i just want to uh, just some uh, 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 add up in uh, abhijit's talk is intradiscal steroid you know some people are doing the, uh, those uh, injections intradiscal uh, we all know that after carriage उंट huge amount of degeneration in the disc which they have put the uh, dye and uh, that's the reason uh, everyone went out of uh, the discograms even uh, carriage also so i think that's a thing which is done by probably some said experts who are doing it in and out but i will personally not recommend doing a intradiscal steroid injection for routine orthopedic practice right for anybody because there are chances of infection you know you put steroids and you are putting you know the simple back pain and patients will have you know non specific infections so it's better to avoid to simpler time tested procedures in lumbar block so i will uh, my personal choice will be facetal blocks uh, pars blocks sacroiliac joint blocks and foraminal blocks or nerve no root blocks that's it no more and uh, the only reason for not doing blocks uh the reason we are not doing uh, a large volume what we used to do the uh, the christmas tree appearance and putting the uh, uh, sacral epidurals because a large volume was needed to separate multi level people used to say three four levels will be covered with epidural injection but nowadays it's completely gone out of fashion people are not preferring a large volume 15 to 20 ml of uh, mixture you have to put uh, from uh, uh, sacral foramen so that's not uh, a standard practice in most of the parts uh, in the western world as well right but uh, otherwise last question, last yeah. question to you uh, uh, what what's your usual uh, mixture what's your cocktail uh, made up of and how much volume uh, 
I I use Triamcin alone and uh, lignocaine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Same here. Uh, Same here. So there are there are some people who actually even use bupivacaine. But you know what happens is these are OPD basis OPD based procedures, and I've had an experience where after using bupivacaine, the patient had a total motor block, and it lasted for six hours. So that patient who was actually supposed to go back home walking had to be under observation till the power recovered. So yeah. now I prefer a short acting local anesthetist. But yeah, there are people who use so long acting I'm using, like yeah, I'm using the bupivacaine. So what what? Correct. Yeah, because I have been, uh, I started my practice uh, for blogs uh, with an anesthetist and they are very much comfortable with that. Yeah. So, uh, so what I have been using a local anesthesia or CC, a lignocaine, preservative free, 20, 25% bupivacaine, another one CC, then uh, uh, one, one or two CC steroid as, uh, as per the levels required. Then I dilute this with uh, uh, distilled water. So almost uh, uh, seven to eight ml of the cocktail uh, of this drug is formed, and I inject uh, uh, this slowly uh, around the nerve. So and I just one important message for all of us, you know, I just want to give is um, we have to be very careful when we are selecting the patient for block. That's number one. And aseptic precautions. We recently operated a patient with spondylodiscalculia with perhaps instability. A young teacher, 35, 36 years old. We had to fix his lumbar spine. And that is one thing which patients will never uh, be happy because they come for a simple procedure. So we should prefer to do it as much as possible. So, so add to add to that. Uh, yes, yes. So, so bupivacaine does cause a lot of motor weakness, but uh, recently the pain specialists have proposed and they are using ropivacaine. So, it has a longer sensory block and a shorter motor block. That is what they are saying. Yes, yes. Is there a consensus on the dosage of steroid? Uh, I think not uh, really. With Kinacord, most of us are using 20 milligram. I, I hope. Yeah. So, so I had I had actually uh, 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 done a little bit of ROL and there was a paper which had done some meta analysis and came out with guidelines which told us that in a year you can use 240 milligrams of steroid or in a lifetime 420 milligrams of steroid. Now, we being surgeons, we really don't understand the concept of steroids, but there are different types of steroids. So whatever steroid you end up using, let it be triamcinolone or methylprednisolone or something, get an equivalent dosage calculated so that you don't exceed the uh, maximum amount of steroid that you can use in a year. So let that be calculated, especially where oh, you are using the, multiple yeah, cases of an epidurals. So this is for or I am what what kind of dosage you are telling me? No, so it is, uh, no, no, so for, for 240 milligrams of Kinacot or Triamcinolone, you can use in an entire year for that patient. So, so if a patient is under chronic pain management, you can divide the dosage and use it. Almost all of us use block only for one or two times, but there are those patients who require multiple blocks to be given through, you know, as a palliative thing for a long time. There you need to know how much dose you can give in a lifetime. And in a lifetime, uh, the epidural steroid dose should not exceed more than 420 milligrams. Okay, I think most of us are not exceiding beyond this. Uh, yeah, 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 of we course. We are not putting the injectable steroids more than three and times. And patient won't come to you so many times, you know, <laughs> for the blocks. Yeah. That's no, but I think no, I the, this, this is getting more important for all these geriatric patients, you know, patients who are above 80, above 90, who don't want surgery and we are just conserving them with pain management. Yeah. They're calculating this is important. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Don't use too much of steroids at one go. That's also important. Where there are a lot of time you see sudden changes in um, heart rate and body, all these things. Uh, uh, Priyank point uh, must be uh, uh, must be with uh, pain pain uh, specialist who are using multiple. They are putting multiple needles at facet levels. Yeah, at yeah, yeah, level, yeah, yeah, at, yeah, at foramen yeah. levels. I think they might be coming closer to this level. What uh, uh, Priyank has mentioned. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Huh? So, uh, Shailesh, shall we move to our next one? Yeah. The next one, uh, I think we are immediately covering up so the same topic. Therefore, the discussions are immediately after the talks. Okay. Uh, and we invite Dr. Sarvadip Dutt for uh, guidelines. Shailesh, Dr. Uh. Sarvadip's talk has been replaced by Dr. Ajay Bir. Dr. Sarvadip is not with us. Okay. So, we yeah. invite so Dr. Him. Ajay Bir will be presenting on clinical, and hist uh, uh, clinical assessment and history taking in neck and back pain. Okay.
अजय डॉक्टर अजय गुड इवनिंग एवरीवन अजय बीर इज योर अजय यू कैन शेयर योर पीपीटी forward to it uh, i trusted it i'll be back in a minute any any technical help you need i guess so, settings are, are you able to share your ppt uh, not right now so uh, so let's move on with our next talk ajay just uh, uh, message in our chat uh, when you are ready so we will move right. to the next session now say it definitely sir yeah, yeah i think so yes yeah so let's call our next speaker uh, dr ankit patel yeah so he has a interesting case to present on spinal tuberculosis without a neuro deficit yes ankit go to ankit ankit dr ankit please share your screen so medical management only we can go ahead with because that's a important topic with priyank right right and then we can go for the biopsy right yeah priyank yeah is ankit here trying i'm just trying to share my screen so are you able to see the screen yeah it's just coming up okay so we'll be discussing about spinal tb without any neurological deficit the dilemmas and controversies in its management so we have a case of 36 year old female she has severe mid back pain fever right more than left girdle pain the gait is normal the neurology is normal but yes the adl is affected she is a homemaker she cannot do the chores she presents to us with this mri Then we can see a D nine, D ten, spondylar discitis with some epidural and pre-vertebral, para-vertebral collection, and uh, foramenal extension. So these are the other cuts. So what do we do now? At this stage, she is totally normal neurology-wise, but yes, the pain is there. Any so constitutional we... symptoms? weight loss anorexia fever no no other symptoms just fever mid back pain she was investigated outside and with this mri she presented to us with the d910 was, was there was the evening right what type fever was evening rise or old day fever or on and off rise of uh, temperature okay so, so ankit her her neurology is absolutely fine so no yeah. not even loss of balance nothing no, no. Even myelopathy early signs No, 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 not at all, not at all. Okay, so only back pain with fever and no leg symptoms, intact neurology. And uh, what's the duration of this? It was it was since two months. Uh, recently, the girdle pain had increased. Okay, she had tremendous uh, uh, root pain along the uh, chest. So that was her uh, troubling thing. She was not able to uh, concentrate on her work because of that. Right, Parasy right, right. I, I will I will prefer to do a X-ray of this patient, dorsal lumbar spine, and a X-ray chest with basic blood blood markers. Yes, yes. So we have the X-ray. Uh, we don't have it, sir, here. But it was it was normal with a with a spindle shaped abscess seen on the AP view. Right, right. So many okay. times, yeah, uh, uh, Ankit, uh, these patients uh, uh, present to us, and most of the time, the AKD has been started. so was this uh, something no, like no the case? akt was not started but but uh, uh, she was already advised empirical akt based upon the mri reporting right, it was right. in fact spinal discitis query to process so that's a good thing so i will uh, i will get uh, the invasion what uh, just shailesh just mentioned and i will like to add uh, with a biopsy i will go ahead with the biopsy okay so that is what we did we did yeah. a ct guided tissue sampling This is the AP view where you can see the spindle shaped abscess at the D910 level with a collapsed disc space. We used a 13 gauge uh, core biopsy needle. We went transparticularly. We can we could aspirate a couple of cc's of uh, pus and 
Pony block for histopathology. Okay, and it's it's yeah. This is CM CM guided, no? CM guided, yes. C, CM guided, yes. Yeah. So she she was all okay. We shared her on AKT, and then it all went well. She didn't uh, worsen. She had a complete re- recovery, and we continued the AKT for one year. So so moving ahead, we have another interesting case now. So this this previous case was a simple uh, illustration of how a, C, a CT guided or a CM guided biopsy uh, can prove the diagnosis and the right. treatment early on if you start a patient will avoid a surgery but this no this no chap- uh, wait wait ankit we will just go on this case the previous one the, which which biopsy normally uh, people prefer a ct guided or see basically we have to discuss how nicely patient is doing but what is the important thing is that biopsy which gave you a, a perfect answer you know this this can come as a pyogenic nowadays post corona we have seen uh fungus coming aspergillus we have cases candida cases we have seen primary candida we have seen and the picture is similar like a spondylodiscitis not spondylitis where only bone so this is a very t- t- i think it's very very important to a certain basic blood investigations x ray chest is mandatory always look out for any primary focus in such cases and a clinical examination when you uh, know that this is a uh, most likely a tb case still biopsy will help us to identify whether this is a standard tuberculosis or a drug resistant one xdr m dr all there are so many variants which we are seeing these days in uh, india and as uh, we are, we are the capital of tuberculosis of uh, uh, spine you know uh, if you see we don't see this in the western world so ct guided biopsy and uh, cm guided biopsy when people talk about a cm guided it's very easy you can do it in a operation theater you can give some amount of sedation you can get a good bony chunk you can aspirate uh, uh, the way dr ankit has shown you can get a good amount of material but when there is a specific level or a soft tissue probably you may miss that and the chances of biopsy missing uh, the diagnosis are high in such scenarios we can use the ct guided because ct guided will have less chunk but more specific and uh, that is uh, in selective cases we also prefer a ct guided otherwise routinely we can do this what uh, standard you can and if, if there is a discitis you can go from the pedicle upward because the bone is soft and you can go in, enter into the disc space that is what is very very important because how you will go to the disc space otherwise in a dorsal spine it's not easy so you go from the the, the pedicle enter the uh, like a cortical bone trajectory cbt screw you just go superior uh, slowly identify it in ap and lateral so that you don't go anterior and be very gentle when you are doing this procedure and then uh, go into the disc take the material out and uh, send it for all what all things you will send it for uh, routine examination ankit so so we have we have a set protocol of uh, sending this sample in two different containers one one is the pure sample and one is a formalin fixed sample the sample which which has no con- uh, which has no additives is, is being sent for all the stains gram jn uh, koh fungal stain then anaerobic culture gene expert and tb mgid and the other core biopsy that we take if we get a core biopsy that is being sent for histopathology and if the tb mgid comes positive at the end of 3 weeks or 6 weeks we have a note mentioned that we will do a 14 drug dst as well because uh, uh, primary cases of uh, drug resistant tuberculosis have have definitely risen up in the last decade also is to know, know the rifamps in resistance nowadays with the pcr and you know ki that that otherwise we all the medications going you know ki in a different direction so we need to be uh, very very sure about what we are giving and uh, this is a controllable ke- uh, t- treatment and medical management is in 95% of the cases patients really can get better or maybe more i can say 96 to 97% patient can get better with appropriate uh, medical management and what tuli described very well was the middle path regime so that still works i think that's the right way to go and in the past we we remember sanitary treatment and all this it's not required anymore we really can give Uh, and get a good uh, specialist if you have any a physician or a tb specialist who can really guide for the appropriate weight of the patient and the medical uh, dosage of this particular uh, anti right uh, shailesh okay. uh, just to add uh, to what you said 
uh, uh, so when i was a resident uh, the trend was uh, just start when we see a pot spine uh, we used to just start the patient on empirical akt and then uh, just as the day passes the trends uh, usually try, try to fade off and so now now and it's the, it's the right thing which has happened now we always do a biopsy and it's a standard thing which uh, which i i want to convey that every spondylar discitis should be uh, undergo a biopsy whatever what how whatever the character is of the uh, mri picture uh, might be okay so uh, because uh, the biopsy uh, just not even help in diagnosis of tuberculosis but also uh, with the mdr uh, uh, pattern which is almost seen in 20 to 25% of our tuberculosis uh, patient okay so and many many uh, many disease uh, mimic uh, uh, tuberculosis so that also has to be differentiated from tuberculosis so oh. biopsy has a very uh, important role in spinal tuberculosis yeah yeah next case ankit so yes we have had surprises and we have all grown salmonella as well so 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 n number of possibilities are there in, and always do a biopsy that is that is the message that we are sending here so we move on to the next case it is an interesting case of a 38 year old male he is a mosaic tile artisan like like a very uh, uh, exquisite work that he used to do but that has to be done only in a squatting position so he initially presented to a different uh, uh, doctor at that time he had severe low back pain with bilateral radiculopathy over the past 8 months he had back pain which was more than leg pain on basis of that old mri he was shut down an empirical akt that mri was showing l5 s1 discitis as well as a presacral collection seen on the sagittal images here so uh, he was put on complete bed rest for a few months initially uh, on presentation currently uh, after 8 months of akt empirical akt his uh, slrt was terminally painful motor power was 55 the gait was guarded okay so he had a low swing phase because he was protecting his uh, pelvis uh, in order to prevent the movements and this is these are his current x rays sagittal and the axial mri so what to do now he was started on an empirical akt Uh, kind of the pain has remained. He has not improved significantly clinically, and he has come to us for an opinion now. And these are the fresh uh, images. Yes, we'll ask uh, Priyank and uh, Abhijit. Yeah, I would uh, like to repeat the biopsy in this patient. He has though the AKT was started. I would like to stop the AKT for five days, and um, I mean it might. the gene expert might come negative but i we would do another um, biopsy to repeat the biopsy so we yes we did a biopsy again this was a ct guided biopsy this time around it was with an 18 gauge needle oh. and it showed everything negative gram chain negative gene expert negative mjt no growth and so the empirical akt was continued okay okay so so could any between the different mris did uh, were, was there a sign of healing between the first and the second mri no there was there was no there was no progressive healing uh, seen the abscess was still there and in fact the promontory was getting eaten up in the in the consecutive mri right. where is the histopath ankit so was there is a histopathology histopath, histopath was there histopathology was unfortunately not done because because the sample that was obtained was very minimal it was an 18 gauge uh, needle with a 11 gauge to axial biopsy needle inside that is i think very important you know a lot of times this biopsy comes negative even the gene expert is negative and the histopath is very important um, in this patients they will guide us if there is case in necrosis or inflammation so i think it's an important factor we have missed here uh, two things which abhijit has mentioned very well is, is that should is repeat a biopsy if the first biopsy is negative there is a good chance 50% chance that the second biopsy might come positive and in such situations where it is negative it's always a challenge and having a histopath will always always help but if you don't get much tissue as ct scan we don't get it much it's it's again a challenge and dilemma for the treating surgeon uh, abhijit you mentioned about stopping akt so, yeah. so most of the time this patient are already started on akt so i don't know uh, um, when i have always had it hesitant to stop akt after it has been started so is there any guidelines to stop akt before biopsy I mean that is the best you can at least get the gene expert positive and stop for a week or so. I don't know if there is any evidence for it, but I stopped the AKT for one week and 
and then get a biopsy done because otherwise on AKT the gene expert is going to come negative. Yes. Yeah, agree, agree. Maybe you can actually study on this. This is can be uh, uh -huh. actually wait for two weeks. Yeah. So present well, pain, pain, yeah. So presently the ESR is forty. The CRP has come down to six, but the patient is clinically not happy. And in the fresh uh, imaging, like the CT scan, you can see that the bony erosion has progressed as compared to the previous uh, images. And uh, he is begging for help. So, so what? Can again a biopsy or uh, operate? What? What are your thoughts? There is no absolutely no uh, weakness. But yes, the ADL is affected, and he wants to get back to work as soon as possible. He's already eight months into resting, right? Without any. So that's a long duration, Ankit. But uh, uh, see, uh, as you initially mentioned, that he is a uh, he is a laborer and he has to bend uh, and do ground level activity. So in this, this is for borderline for me, uh, because the biopsy is coming negative and it has already a long duration has been passed. I am more inclined to our open biopsy. Uh, so uh, that is one thing. Also, I want to confirm whether this is MDR or no. So a repeat biopsy can be attempted, but open biopsy is also fine for me. So, so this time we'll we'll offer a CT guided biopsy again, or use a bigger bore needle and then do a CAM guided or operation yeah, theatre. I would love to go to CAM guided. I will, there is a huge uh, pre vertebral uh, uh, collection of soft tissue, and there is two T T two hyper intense uh, and pre and para vertebral collection. I would like to target that. If I am able to get some uh, disc, uh, uh, the granulation tissue which is inside inside the alpha S one disc, I will also uh, try try yeah. to take a core from there. So two needles, one in the pre vertebral uh, for the pre vertebral soft tissue, and second one in the disc space. Assume assuming that we we get a good sample this time and we get a positive positive report as well, showing that the uh, gene expert is sensitive. There's no resistance even even on fourteen drug DST. Also, we don't see any resistance. But still, this doesn't solve the patient's problem. So, so should we should we just go ahead and fix it also and do an open biopsy, or counseling for a biopsy again, again bed rest and continuing the AKT as per the reports of the biopsy. So, so regarding gene expert, yes, it is a uh, sensitive and specific. Almost, I think ninety five to ninety seven percent. But there is also a uh, three percent uh, uh, some uh, lacuna. Like, you know. So, so if you go back to the history, he is a, a tile worker. He wants to yes. sit, and if yes. you want to fix, you will have to fix from four to S one or yes. four to S two. Elvis. Yeah. So uh, you know, okay, again, uh, offering uh, surgeries in uh, this particular profession is not a good idea. Yes. yes. What best we can do, we should try that. You know, in view of his working style, because whatever you say, they are not that comfortable when you fix the pelvis. True. in general so, consensus so we had this discussion with the patient and then patient chose yeah. the C, uh, cm guided biopsy again so we did a cm guided biopsy this time we put in a curate through that uh, mini open uh, technique we could get a gene expert positive there was no recombinant resistance but unfortunately there was no growth on the mgit at 6 weeks so we had to continue the akt in the same format we we did uh, take help of a uh, specialist and uh, based upon his recommendations we added two more drugs from the second line and then continued it good good so this was this was at the 8th month uh, of the uh, ongoing akt but he followed up again at the end of one year of akt he had severe intractable back pain the l5 radiculopathy had increased now there was no motor weakness still uh, and he was going into depression so what was the mri okay only only the back clinical presentation you have been present yes, so, yes, so that See, yeah, uh, basic. Can I can I come in here? Yeah. yeah. Uh, see, Ankit. Basically, at this stage, we know that uh, uh, through serial blood reports and your MRI images and everything, that the infection is kind of getting under control, but the in uh, the instability pain is increasing. Okay. Uh, at at whatever stage the instability becomes that bad that the patient is not able to manage his daily activity activities of daily living. that's the time you go in and you operate and so that's that's the, like with the history what you're giving it's a no brainer at this stage you want to go in and do the surgery fix the spine the l5 radiculopathy is because the l5 body if you see has completely has partially gotten destroyed and there is a collapse over there so that is the reason why the patient is having that l5 radiculopathy true 
so so assuming that we all moving towards and the patient also wanting a fixation uh, regardless of his profession uh, what what will be the ideal uh, levels that we fix here that actually depends upon uh, the latest ct scan and how much of the bo- how much see instability might be because of uh, might be uh, instability might be because of a discal instability or it might have really e- eroded the bone and destroyed and caused a massive obvious instability so depending upon how much is the bony destruction you could uh, you could limit your fixation to the lumbosacral junction or you might have to get into the pelvis that actually depends upon what yeah, is shown sure. on the x-ray and ct scan at the sure. time of surgery because, because if you see on the right much. side of this this ct there is a destruction to the track of the pedicle if you see yes and going to it is going to be a challenge for putting the s1 screw because the track is uh, completely uh, lytic on the is right this side. the latest one so this is two months before that. This is nine months. At, 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 no, at nine months, right? So what what was the images at one year? Uh, so at the end of one year, we just did a X-ray, and since because of financial constraints, we we assumed that the X-ray and the CT scan didn't show much difference. And based upon this CT scan, we did our planning. Yeah. So then it deserves a lumbar pelvic fixation. So this is what we did ahead. And this is the immediate post op on the left side and the one year follow up on the right side. He is happy. He is able to squat also, but not that to that great extent. But yes, he has resumed his work. Okay. Correct. Good. Yeah, as I rightly said, the right side S one you couldn't get that hold. Big. Yeah, it was it was a empty <laughs> shell. Yeah. Ankit, uh, at the L four five, why have you not any antibody fusion? We just did a post collateral. We should we should have. Uh-huh. Because because we had initially at that time thought that L4 so that was the, the screw there's lysis around that screw already L4 for, yeah. so. on on the follow up there is a lysis at L4 yeah but what was the diagnosis final diagnosis uh, non MDR uh, tuberculosis okay good so good moving ahead so what happened to this patient uh, everything settled the MRI yes 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 he is doing fine. All the blood parameters also have come down. So, so what? What's the reason you felt that he was not improving uh, with AKT? And what happened after the surgery? That so, so basically, the the at the tissue and blood level, the response was there. But because of the mechanical instability and the foraminal height narrowing at L5, uh, he was having that pain. Okay, but the uh, the uh, soft tissues uh, uh, were also not resolving with the AKT. They were anterior. Oh, Dheeraj, if you actually go and see the images back now, you will notice that at the serial MRIs, ah. there is fatty replacement of the marrow. It's just the anterior soft tissue which was not uh, getting resolved. Right. So, so this is like those delayed response that you see in right. tuberculosis. Right. Right. That's what. So understanding the serial MRI also is important. And uh, just, just a sterile abscess should not be the reason for going in. True, true. Good point. Okay. So, a very interesting case of a seven-year-old uh, female, a g- chubby girl. She had fever and neck pain since two months. Uh, initially, it was uh, not diagnosed, but then uh, with, with increasing neck pain, she was investigated and then she presented to us with this MRI. She had no deficit. Uh, there was no relief with rest or oral medications. So here we have a C7D1 uh, spondylodiscitis with a huge epidural abscess. But yes, since the space available for the cord is quite good, she had no weakness. So, how do we go about here? What kind of biopsy or what kind of uh, treatment? Silas, sir? I think uh, this, this pay, again, it's, it's challenging because it's a cervical thoracic junction, you see. And uh, <clears throat> it's not very easy when we talk about biopsy curve because you have to reach, you have to go from the pedicle, go <laughs> in, you have to breach that anterior cortex and enter it and get it. So I think CT guided biopsy will be an ideal one for this particular girl. And if there is a said expert who can do it, they really can get a good uh, tissue from this. And uh, I think I will uh, prefer a conservative uh, trial first with anti uh, with uh, pain medications for pain relief and whatever the bug comes. So yes, that's what we discussed with the patient. And we did a CT guided biopsy. Okay. And, uh, she was put on this brace initially. Good. So presently she's just one one month uh, post the biopsy and it grew uh, AFB acid fast bacilli and the gene expert was positive with no resistance. 
so is this is the brace good so the question here now is is the brace good for this uh, this girl i think luckily there is a soft tissue which is uh, anterior to the vertebral body there is not much of a discitis chances of collapse is less when you start it immediately you started i think this will 3 to 4 weeks the pb bacilli starts responding well so i think this should this should be good enough for general because she is very small girl you know putting right. it on a halo that's not good idea you know ki so, 7 uh, months I yeah 7 year, year old we can be other <laughs> So you we, have the CT scan uh, at that level. So it does show bone on bone contact of C7 and D1 with a little bit of kyphosis and uh, uh, some spurs going to the canal. But yes, uh, the overall the canal is uh, clear. Okay, yeah, I think she should she should settle in next four to six weeks completely. So so how should we be observing her? Like what what is everybody's observation protocol for these kind of cases wherein you have a junctional level? you are initially going ahead with the biopsy report positive and bracing the patient but how how i uh, think something called as a interval mri and a bl- blood parameter blood parameters are the most important ones they will tell you that the patient is responding well we have seen the abscesses remaining at same place for up to 120 to 150 days in uh, tb a lot of time is you have the diagnosis but the abscess is not settling and then they suddenly starts you know at 3 to 4 months so i think just uh, maybe 2 to 3 months you can do a mri scan that will be safer which will tell us how much the abscess is getting settled and maybe uh, uh, the blood parameters will tell the patient herself will tell her pain is gone no fever no symptoms and she will be playful right right anki just to add to the uh, this uh, i will uh, i will tell and educate the parents about the warning signs so any any loss of balance uh or any 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 symptoms in legs any weakness ball bladder involvement they has to report back to me yeah, yeah that's very very okay. important any, yeah. any breathlessness any dysphagia because of abscess might be increased that has to be reported back to me okay mobilization uh, uh, so she can take out so many patients uh, uh, tend to use this cover overuse this collar even on bed rest okay and there there might develop some ulcer uh, over the occipital region so uh, i i advise them not to use the collar on lying down on lying down they have to remove the collar when they are uh, resting their head on the bed okay and something uh, a pillow or some uh, roll sheet can be supporting their neck uh, on the side while they are sleeping oh, yeah yeah correct so, this small things will be helpful and just while getting up from bed let them apply the uh, brace first and uh, then they can uh, sit and stand okay with restricted uh, uh, mobility uh, only for uh, a toilet and uh, food Uh, I, I I like to keep this patient restricted uh, uh, for going outside the house for at least three months or uh, depending upon how how she responds. Okay. As Dheeraj rightly said about the educating the parents, you know, okay, as we always we all know that sanitary treatment in the past they used to send the patient outside the outskirt of the city uh, when there is an infection or a TB, and because number one is a good air, number. Two, to yes. good water and good food these things are still important in today's practice we don't send the patient on the outskirts because we have the diagnosis we have the medications but good food uh, and uh, that also is very very important because uh, that will supplement in general patient you know key for patient study so we can ask them uh, educating parents about all these things basic small things is very very important yes yes agree so so the message is well taken that uh, if the disease is picked up early uh, we can get a ct guided or a cm guided biopsy get the diagnosis and follow the middle path regimen as well so if we have if we have time we'll just quickly run through another yeah, case of ankit one more thing in this particular small child because now the level is high dorsal spine and uh, in uh, upper dorsal or dorsal spine if you are trying to do a ct guided biopsy or siam guided biopsy this uh, you know ki though the soft tissue is anterior but the bone can be soft and when you are putting your needle jamchi the it can go anterior and it can be a catastrophic or a devastating problem you have to be very careful a said expert needs to be very careful when you are uh, putting your guide wire and needle so always check it in your siam this level is again very very tricky for lateral you know you don't see because the shoulder will come in absolutely between absolutely. lower cervical and upper dorsal so we absolutely. have to have that judgment of uh, only ap x ray but lateral 
also is very very important you need to calculate how much needle should go how much it should remain over the skin so i think uh, it is it is very important that we should not unnecessarily dig into it if you have a ct uh, guided that's the best thing which we can do it at this particular level also in cb junction yeah so these are difficult areas in spine and space yeah. pediatric so the pediatric because of the destruction the anatomy is deranged the pedicle size is very few, uh, half a centimeter yeah yeah the anatomy is not clear okay the neural elements the structures are very uh, 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 very close around the pedicle okay? correct okay and uh, also the lateral view what you have perfectly mentioned it won't be seen only uh, the upper dorsal spine c7 junction is not seen mo in most of the lateral uh, cm yeah yeah these patients are not the ideal candidate for fluoroscopic image okay yeah. so any level below d6 uh, to the sacrum i think uh, th this can be done fluoroscopically but one shouldn't attempt fluoroscopy above that yeah message well taken sir so here we have a uh, 66 year old elderly diabetic male yes uh, yeah ankit in your time just rapid fire no discussions now because we are at 625 yeah so so we'll move on to the next uh, speaker no no you can go with the case rapid fire case okay so just speak it just male diabetic known because of fungus chondritis many many years so he had this uh, sudden onset right groin and anterior thigh pain so he was initially asked to do a hip x ray as as anybody will suspect that in an ankylosis chondritis patient there might be some hip pathology hip x ray was overall normal and the spine x ray was showing some uh, anterior sinusoidal break so probably uh, the previous uh, orthopod thought that there must be some injuries and they uh, conserved him but he failed the conservative trial on presentation to us he had near normal neurology but he could walk only 10 steps okay and that was not a typical antalgic gait but it was more of a radiculopathy so that is why we went ahead and did an mri and the mri showed this there was a l23 and an l34 discitis with a right sided psoas abscess the canal was totally normal but yes on the sagittal images you can see that the two discs are bright uh, and the other ones are other, others are black so he was counseled for a biopsy again he being a diabetic we were expecting uh, probably a gram negative bacteremia must have caused this so we did put in a spinal needle under c arm fl or fluoroscopy guidance and we could aspirate around 3 uh, cc of pus mm -hmm. and which grew surprisingly Five afb this time afb oh wow yes yes so interesting case uh, there was no destruction seen on the mri two level uh, disc are involved and uh, the pre para vertebral collection is uh, minimal so as is there only right so side yeah. right so right. have had parent people are diabetic or, or or chronic kidney disease patients on dialysis and they regularly grow uh, klebsiella and pseudomonas because of uh, the gram negative bacteria that they have so we were thinking on that lines but we did choose to do a biopsy and then it showed uh, yeah in our practice we have 11 different infections so far identified in spine apart from tb okay so what are they just uh, educate us no, no all of them you just name it and brucella mucormycosis aspergillus candida staphylococcus streptococcus uh, yeah, pseudomonas uh, you just name it you yeah, know primary we are primary discitis yeah, yeah, yeah primary discitis oh, good good collection So to end end the discussion here, she is a 28 year old female, uh, young OT nurse. She has severe low back pain and a left lower limb radiculopathy. Uh, fever since only two weeks, uh, but the walking distance is quite less. Motor is five by five, but ADL is affected. So again, we here we have a very atypical kind of an abscess, which is eroding into the bone as well as well as into the psoas on the left side. There is no canal compromise. Can you just enlarge the image? The Actuals, or oh, you have a coronal? Is it is it fine here? Yeah, yeah, this okay. Okay, fine. So there's a skip level, okay. So there's one level up where there is a distortion of bone as well as a peri para para vertebral abscess plus one normal disc and a lower level you have another same similar looking uh, condition here. So since uh, she was she was a uh, uh, nurse, okay. we counseled her for an early biopsy and we did a trans particular uh, aspiration we could get a very minimal sample but yes this too grew uh, tuberculosis perfect okay.
you're playing the inning of Virat Kohli today, as uh, we all have seen today's match. See, one man show and uh, very beautiful cases, Sankit. A lot of learnings. And uh, we move on to the next topic. Dr. Dhiraj Sonone, I invite you to speak about how to do the biopsy. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, the uh, West Zone, for allowing to uh, present my, uh, my talk and giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity. So, my topic is on spinal biopsy. Uh, and uh, uh, it's very important topic, uh, as we all discuss, uh, whenever we are not knowing uh, what it is going on with the patient, uh, we have in we are in difficult scenario. Uh, the uh, the scenario worsens. We always try to rely on biopsy. And yes, obviously we have to diagnose. And uh, there are many other things apart from diagnosis. What uh, biopsy provides us, and uh, we will discuss about that too. And uh, apart from that, uh, uh, how to get uh, so in especially in tuberculosis, the yield yield for uh, uh, for getting uh, uh, growth is uh, very less. So here we'll be discussing what, what we'll be like to see on MRI, what we'd like to see on CT scan and, and uh, correlate that with uh, your fluoroscopy uh, imaging if you are doing yourself and target that zone. So we get the maximum out of that. Also, we'll, we'll see various papers, uh, especially from outside as well as Indian authors, what they have described uh, to get a maximum yield uh, uh, from this uh, approach. So we will we'll learn uh, when, when we have to do this biopsy, the ways to target uh, uh, various lesions, the areas to target and how to, what, what to decide uh, on the images uh, and difficult zones uh, where we have to avoid, just we have seen one case uh, with a difficult zone, when not to do, uh, this also one we must, must be knowing, uh, where, what is double biopsy or multiple uh, core biopsy from a single vertebra Some network problem. We cannot hear you. So I will speak, you know, okay, what, what, learning in the learnings, ways to target, which areas to target, difficult zones, when not to do any alternatives, multiple biopsy, double biopsy from single vertebra or vice versa. When we should consider a CT guided biopsy, whether we can do a, like in SOAS, we can see, you can do a, a ultrasound guided biopsy or a pigtail also we can do techniques and literature. There is, there is a problem in, I think, your presentation, some technical error. Can you rejoin? Hello, Dheeraj. Uh, I think you need to rejoin Karna Padega Aapko. So in the meantime, uh, Silas sir, so what is, what is the go-to needle that you use for a fluoroscopy guided biopsy? What works best in your hands? No, I, uh, I, I normally use the standard Jamshidi needles for biopsies and uh, you don't need, see, basically it's a, it's the study of the anatomy of the, uh, it's not a needle which will do a good biopsy, it's the anatomy and understanding of the spine. You need to assess the x-rays, 
you need to assess the mri as well you need to identify which area i need to tap in so that i can go well most important is putting the needle and checking the needle where we are going to go uh, if you are trying and always always make sure that you are taking biopsy material from at least two areas so that if you are missing normally literature talks about 60 to 70% chances that the biopsy will come positive 40% chances that it can be negative and how to because for any patient if you tell ki ha i did a biopsy whatever the hospital or the bill is this much and they will feel what you have cheated us you know ki you done the biopsy the right. hospital has taken money and it's negative how come it is negative when you are showing it on mri so we need to uh, make sure that at least two areas we should try to take when we are uh, doing this and important is that we should tell the patient and family that there is a chance 20% 25% that the biopsy can come negative i am going to involve a infection disease specialist for your particular case because there are various things which can happen so this uh, counseling and guiding the patient is very very important in uh, this patient when they come to you with a old mri a lot of time what happens patients are already uh, on akt they come to you with mri which is one two month old i think there is no need to shy away a lot of mris are not very good quality mri so do a good quality mri repeat the x ray blood parameters and at least six weeks i i always believe that if it is more than six weeks you should do the mri so that you know how much the disease has progressed how much the disease has helped the patient to reduce the amount of uh, the lesion and uh, again uh, i i normally prefer if like in this case ultrasound guided also can be done it's very easy you, they just need ultrasound guided the radiologist can do and routine radiologists who are doing some kind of basic procedure they can do a, a soas biopsy it, it's very easy because they get a large volume and debulking of the tissue you know the debulking of the disease when it happens the akt also works better the more amount of uh, debulking happens uh, it it is useful for the patient uh, as well as us you know so that the patient starts getting better faster and ct guided as we discussed uh, and uh, see ankit i feel now even ct guided we should know the person who does a good biopsy True. a lot of time there are certain nowadays in all the cities there are radiologists who are trained into intervention in most of the cities all across india so no need to shy away if you if your particular city is or town is not having a specialist you can send this patient jaake aa jao unke paas jaake biopsy karke aa jao there is nothing to shy away that only i will do it why not the patient can go do the biopsy report will anyway come online so that can be accessed and you know ki we make sure that we are uh, treating a right uh, bug we are treating a right disease rather than giving blanket uh, akt i think we need to uh, change our uh, self to not starting the akt because tb or infection is fine uh, if you see physicians also treat surgeons also treat a lot of people treat this disease somehow and they come to us when they are in trouble or they are not better if you realize almost 30% of the patients are already treated by uh, uh, people who are not uh, treating spine so the message here is that uh, when we do a plan of biopsy or when we send the patient to a biopsy center cd card biopsy center the message here is that we should take at least a good enough sample and at the initial moment if you get one cc pus don't be happy you go in try a different trajectory and get more tissue because sometimes uh, the lesion has bacilli in the periphery not in the center so getting some uh, tissue from the wall of that abscess or some granulation tissue is also helpful especially for gene expert also like what uh, ankit has shown some cases there were the pus was anterior but if the pus is on epidural space or if there is a compression what normally people are talking that you do a less invasive or a minimally invasive or endoscopic lavage and uh, take the material so you don't need to destruct too much you know just take that material debulk the tissue debulk the canal and start akt or whatever the medications and very good results very good outcomes rather than fixing all the spines if there is a selective area which is not destructing the bones the, if there is angular deformity if the patient is worsening instability spinal atresis you have no option but to fix isn't it yes priyank yes what is Ayer. your take what is your take on cervical spine infected spondylodiscitis how you will 
deal the patient who is come to you with the infective spondylodiscitis there is no uh, angular deformity or collapse but there is a large abscess which is seen anterior and around correct so uh, see basically uh, all all kind of infection let it be at any place unless and until there is an absolute indication for surgery like there is a significant neurological deficit with bowel bladder involved you should always try to be conservative because here you want to get ahead of the bug and you need to know what you are dealing with so that you have a better control on the disease uh, for that you need a biopsy now since we are just talking on different types of biopsy in cervical spine it's ideal that you try to get a ct guided biopsy done a cm guided biopsy in cervical spine is very dangerous because uh, the, uh, you know you don't have a big margin of error in cervical spine if you are not able to get a cm guy a, a ct guided biopsy done then a safer other option would be a mini open uh, biopsy from the anterior side and trying to get the sample from there uh, once you have the sample of course you start uh, treating but it should be done by the one who is doing the cervical spine surgery correct correct uh so so again like i i absolutely agree with what the discussion was going on that whoever does the biopsy you should be in sync with them so if it's an interventional radiologist just don't send it across to them you should be uh, you should talk to them you should tell them where exactly you want the needle how much sample you want because at the end of the day you are the one who's treating the patient and if you're doing an anterior uh, then of course it has to be a spine surgeon who's going to do because it's just like an acdf approach where you just open up go to the anterior part of the disc space now with the endoscopic era coming up you can even put an endoscope over there and get a little wash and al also the sample from there so that's how you should uh, deal with this as soon as you have the sample you should start with your antibiotics uh, the anti tb medicines or if it's a pyogenic infection that and at the same time immobilize the patient uh, cervical spine patients being a hypermobile spine you should have a close watch on these patients so i usually call them once a month to my clinic uh, where uh, i get an x ray done and clinically examine the patient and 3 uh, 3 monthly i get an mri done especially for those patients with a uh, big huge abscess which is touching the radiological cord compression but clinically okay to conserve so a close watch and educate the pa parents about the red flag so that's my brief guideline as to how to deal with a cervical infection which which uh, normally which uh, you uh, uh, support you prefer to give to the patient because patient wants they have a problem soft collar or a philadelphia collar no so if if suppose so according to me soft collar does not immobilize the patient soft collar is just to keep the patient uh, tell the patient to be careful if you want to immobilize the patient you have to start with the philadelphia collar and of course then you have the bigger collars which are there like the somi brace or the halo uh, but uh, practically if you actually uh, look at a patient with a halo it is very difficult to manage such patient so uh, uh, so that that has to be uh, looked at but technically uh, uh, a soft collar can be later on given to the patient once you know that you don't want an absolute immobilization and all you want is the patient to be little careful so that gives a placebo effect but if you want to immobilize then it has to be a philadelphia collar or bigger than that perfect that's that's a uh, clear message and it's a very uh, 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 easy for everyone to follow and one thing uh, what uh, priyank was talking about that ct guidance so if it is not there in my institute or my place i think we can identify every area every 50 to 100 kilometers in india will have a person who is doing it just we need to have a open eye and send it to him discuss and ask them what you want to send a lot of time they send something because radiologists are not comfortable uh, they are not treating the disease therefore they will send what routine they are, they are knowing it's always it's our responsibility to talk to them and tell what you want from that sample because a lot of time they will send something and then you say why you didn't send and this guy will say oh you never asked me to so make sure that you're telling what you want to get it right at the first time i think uh, yeah yes priyank yeah just just one small addition especially when we are talking about cervical spine a lot of times these big abscesses in cervical spine actually end up stabilizing the spine so the when when you are taking biopsy for the cervical spine uh, don't be very aggressive in trying to aspirate and uh, remove all the abscess yeah, because yeah. let's say a c1 c2 uh, cox 
uh, the abscess actually stabilizes it. So if you have an acute uh, uh, drainage of the abscess, it can lead to instability and uh, neurological deterioration. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well done. I think we are almost at the end part of the webinar. Any questions to anyone? I think Dheeraj is uh, probably stuck. He's not able to get online. Uh, do you want me to start off with the medical management? And if he comes back online, then... Yeah, yeah that should be okay. Yeah, that should be okay. Because that's important. And that is the most important talk. Yeah, please proceed. Yeah. All right. So basically, a lot of things that I'm going to cover today has been discussed. And, uh, and I'm just going to touch base on that and summarize it. But, uh, but you get so many patients with such type of uh, history where there have been multiple failed surgical procedures for spine TB. And finally, you realize that uh, at the end of the day, a correct biopsy culture and sensitivity was what saved the day. Uh, so that chemotherapy. Uh, so that's what my talk is going to be all about. Uh, we follow these 10 dictums. If you follow these 10 commandments, then you will not burn your hands when you're dealing with uh, medical management of spine TB. Uh, so as our teachers have taught us that spine TB in the absence of grotesque deformity and uh, devastating complications like neurological deficit is purely a medical condition. So uh, is the scope really limited to non-structural non uh, lesions or early TB? Not really. Even in patients with abscess, high disease road, drug resistance TB, instability, kyphosis, and early neurological deficit, there is definitely a scope of non-surgical treatment. And you have uh, seen in all the cases which have been presented how the patients have pulled through with medicines. So similarly, in this patient, which had a bad cord compression, did very well with the ma medical management. Uh, so, so, uh, so are these images. On the first look, they look very ghastly. But look at what happens at six months. All the soft tissue has been dissolved and the cord is free now. Uh, we think that even in a highly mobile spine like this cervical thoracic TB or cervical TB, they even also end up doing well with a non-surgical treatment. Uh, paravertical abscesses regress. Uh, disease load actually is not that important. It also goes down. And even instability is transient and eventually everything stabilizes. So the scope of medical management in TB has really expanded and we need to really use it at, at its fullest. So that's, uh, that's important. Now, when do we really start with anti-TB medicine? Is it based on the, uh, on the clinical pictures or the radiology? Not really. By now, we have emphasized enough to tell you that empirical AKT in today's day and era is not an option. Like, look at all these MRIs. All of these MRIs are classical MRIs looking like spondylodiscitis and TB. But none of them, none of them were actually tuberculosis. All of them were different pathologies like GCT, myeloma, fungal infections, plasma cytoma on tissue diagnosis. Uh, similarly, all of these lesions which prima facie appear uh, like a pat, uh, you know a bad pathology like tumor or osteoporotic fracture actually all of them were tuberculosis so uh, so the thing is that you should not make a radiological diagnosis of spine tb always always you should start chemotherapy after a biopsy a culture and a drug sensitivity test has been done uh, multi drug resistance extremely drug resistance total drug resistant tuberculosis are on the rise and we are to blame for it because we just randomly start on anti tb medicines and stop them when we wish so this is one thing that we should not do now historically the diagnosis of tb was done by a lj culture which took 12 to 14 weeks uh, in the newer age, it moved to TB Bactec and now TB MGIT or TB Midget is the gold standard for cultures of tuberculosis. It usually takes three to six weeks for all the cultures to come across. Uh, till that time, there are other molecular methods which are available like gene expert and line probe assays. Now, these, are, these, uh, these, uh, these require small sample. They have rapid uh, results. So you can get uh, results as early as two hours. And you would know that if the patient is resistant for rifampicin or no. So it gives us a brief idea about if it is TB or not. And it, what are the resistance pattern? The difference between TB gene expert and line probe assay is that uh, line probe assay usually uh, is uh, positive or it's of use when you have a smear positive sample. So if you take a sample and you take a smear of it, and if it stains for tubercular bacilli, 
then then line probe assay is worthwhile but tb gene expert above board is useful for all types of uh, molecular diagnostics uh, now you have newer gene expert which is called as gene expert ultra which has come which is even more sensitive than the previous gene expert uh, there are other other ways by which you can monitor it by blood parameters like esr crp but they are not important diagnostically they help to just monitor the progression or regression of the disease uh, the older tests that we know like tb igm igg or montuk's test or gold test they are absolutely useless and you should not uh, prescribe them anymore uh, tb pcr might be of use in western countries where tb is not endemic but in india it is again of no use so uh, as a summary the diagnostics te tests are gene expert or lpa uh, then histopath and do the cultures by tb midget method right and it's now available all around the country even our uh, even the even the government schemes have uh, these uh, testing facilities now uh, once once uh, we know how do we start with the akt what is the protocol we sometimes come across these patients who are uh, who have come to you at 3 months because uh, they have been started on anti tb medicines and you see that there is uh, you know worsening of uh, uh, tb on the mri and then you just casually think that okay now the patient is not responding let's just add uh, a second line akt because the patient is mdr well that is something that you should absolutely not do you should follow a thorough systematic non operative protocol uh, india being leading in tb has got multiple publications and protocols laid down for all of you to follow but briefly uh, the protocol for non surgical management of tb is starting with uh, hrze for 2 months and then continuing with hre for 7 to 10 months in india there is no real benefit of adding streptomycin Uh, because thirty percent of Indians are resistant to streptomycin, so streptomycin can be used as a second line AKT if it is a sensitive product. But uh, primarily for a, uh, a sensitive uh, TB, you do not use uh, streptomycin. You have to add other medicines like calcium, vitamin D, and give them other things like diet. And you know, uh, Dr. Hargavkar was telling you the importance of fresh air, sunlight, all of these things. Uh, now. sometimes what happens is that in spite of uh, you know in spite uh, of giving anti tb medicines there is a poor response so in those patients today it is recommended that you repeat the biopsy there is no role of adding a single new drug that is a crime and you should not do it empirical second line uh, medicine should be ideally given by tb uh, tb physicians or someone who or infectious disease pair physician who deals with it and at least four new drug including an injectable should be added so a single drug addition is not at all an option uh, you should continuously monitor the patient to see the uh, you know to see the response which should not be just on the basis of uh, radiology you should also do serial uh, clinical clinical checks and labs uh mri becomes mandatory at 3 months after starting treatment and 12 months just prior to stopping the akt so what to do if we get such type of an uh, mri picture where the patient has taken anti tb medicines and uh, at 2 months you have done an mri and it's showing that there is worsening uh, rather than completely jumping into a conclusion that this patient is a uh, mdr tb check what the medicines the patient has taken most of these patients are taking these combination drugs like akt4 and so all uh, well that's the most common uh, problem the patient does not take a adequate dose of primary akt and that's why it's failing so you should administer the correct dose of tb medicine so now it's a gold standard that it has to be weight adjusted dose rather than just a combination akt and uh, you've got standard dosage which is mentioned over there you can just have a note of it uh, like for example why it's important let's say a patient is averaging at 62 kg just focus on isoniazid which is 300 mg per day that same patient if that patient is 40 kg the dose reduced is to 200 mg per kg and if the patient is 88 kg it's directly double that's 400 mg per kg so just with so much of weight fluctuation which we commonly see in our clinical practice uh, the dosage of akt changes so that's why dosage of akt is very important 
there is also some role of steroids in management of uh, anti tb uh, you know uh, spine tb uh, methylprednisolone is used in high dosage for 3 days and then tapered with uh, oral medicines because it has got a neuroprotective and anti inflammatory effect of course there are uh, side effects of using steroids so you have to weigh the pros and cons but let's say if you are trying to conserve a patient with neurology and by giving st uh, steroid the neurology goes away then that's a big benefit for the patient so steroids can be used and you should use it as, as your discretion now uh, an ideal patient is someone who starts off with a bad spondylodiscitis and at a repeated mri you see that the soft tissue is going down you are seeing bony uh, fatty replacement of the marrow clinically the patient is getting better so that's like an ideally medically managed patient of tb however things are not always ideal and they can go differently like you could have patients who are radiologically worsening uh on even though being on sensitive akt uh you could or you could have patients who are uh, rapidly improving and at 3 months you see the pus has uh, immediately gone down so there is something called as a slow responder or paradoxical reaction that you see on an mri or there are some groups of patients who are rapid responders does not mean that your uh, treatment modality should change or your duration should change you should have your protocols very well in place and uh, monitoring the recovery is very critical in this patient the recovery cannot just be monitored on the basis of mri you should have clinical improvement in the patient in form of weight gain improved appetite reduced pain improved mobility and reduction in the spinal signs uh, the mri should show improvement reduction in the soft tissue uh, reduction in the bony edema fatty replacement of the marrow and the lab markers like esr crp should consistently keep going down if all of these criteria are being met that means the patient is recovering uh there is no real hard criteria that has uh, been defined in literature for recovering tb but these are all the different uh, things that you look at so you might have patient at 6 months akt still showing significant amount of abscess at 12 months still showing significant amount of abscess but if that patient you stop akt at 12 months and uh, repeat an mri you will see that the abscess has disappeared so the the radiology itself is not the only criteria you have to look at the clinical and the lab marker also so basically the important point here is that you have to monitor the treatment closely and carefully uh you not just uh, from the surgical point of view you should also being the primary care physician looking at all the side effects that can arise out of uh, anti tb medicines and there are bunch load of side effects like if if you actually read each and every one of them it's like going back and giving your pharmacology exam again uh the important side effects that we can immediately screen are nausea vomiting poor appetite and abdominal pain which is usually caused by the anti tb medicines but these could be those early signs of uh, akt induced hepatitis as well so you have to monitor them well you have to do your uh, you know you have to do your ast levels and if they are more three times or more than the upper limit of normal then uh, then then you have had it and the patient has started developing akt induced hepatitis in such a in such a situation you have to stop hrz for this patient and start them on uh, amikacin etanamide or and a higher quinolone till the ast is normal then eventually you have to start adding one drug after the other so you add rifampicin first if it works then you add isoniazid and then you can add pyrazinamide so there's like a protocol which has been mentioned as to how to deal with akt induced hepatitis and change the medicines uh so it's important that at as a surgeon although you uh, your primary job is to operate uh, when you're non surgically treating patients with tb you have to know about the side effects and look for the early side effects of uh, anti tb medicines the next question that arises is how long do you want to continue this uh, you know akt do we stop at 6 months 12 months 18 months 24 months now again you get so many literature out there you've got you've got your colleagues from mainstream orthopedics talking about uh, they are uh, they are regimen but as far as spine is concerned there has been a lot of uh, lot of literature out there and one good study that had come out of hinduja hospital what a randomized prospective single blinded study where uh, where you know 100 patients were taken up and 50 patients the anti tb medicines was stopped at 6 months and 50 patients it was stopped at 12 months this is a very high powered study which actually concluded that the result of stopping medicines at 6 months and 12 months was the same uh, uh, although it's it's still in the very early stage 
by as of now the standard given criteria is you give anti tb medicines in spine tb up to 12 months there is a possibility in the future as more and more uh, research comes out there the guidelines might be varied but right now everybody is sticking to 9 months to 12 months all right uh but there is, but you have to remember that there is no reason to continue anti tb medicines for more than 12 months in a patient who is culture proven tb all right now what to do if the patient is drug resistant that's the newer threat that's the problem of the r and uh, you know estimated 5000 mdr tb spondylodiscitis patients seen uh, you know uh, in a year all around the world Uh, with a higher incidence being in children uh, in fact a study done by the wadia hospital uh, uh, they found that in a, co a cohort of uh, children who were treated surgically for spine tuberculosis a higher complication rate and thus a poor surgical outcome were found to be associated with drug resistance disease so drug resistance is not just the problem of the uh, of the chest physician it's our problem because our surgical results are going to fail and you have to understand that uh, you know people who have got tb who are less than 40 years old you have to be aware that it, it might be mdr tb because it's only 40 years back when the first resistant bug was identified uh, so you should have suspect of mdr in patients who one show no clinical improvement or worsening despite of 3 months of treatment who have no clinical improvement and patient is getting incorrect regimen or inadequate doses there you have uh, there probably it's an induced uh, uh, resistance uh, the patient has a history of irregular drug intake is a known case uh, known contact with a mdr case is a diabetic or hiv positive patient alcoholics drug addicts and appearance of new lesions on the scans uh, while under treatment so if any of these criteria are met you should in your head start suspecting these patients with mdr tb and don't shy away from doing a repeat biopsy if you are suspecting uh, mdr when we start talking about mdr tb there are bunch of drugs that are available and they are grouped into various uh, categories and all of them have a lot of side effects so that again is a different classroom altogether but a general idea is that uh, second line drugs are less effective than primary have more side effects are more expensive and you need to take them for a longer duration like 2 years 2 and a half years and the mortality because of medicine itself is as high as 10% uh if you if you have to yourself start a, a patient on mdr tb then it has to be at least five new drugs which includes one injectables and has to be given for at least 24 months so these are the five groups and you can start picking the drugs from this group uh, the group one is first line oral anti tubercular drugs the second is injectable anti tubercular drugs group 3 is fulo quinolones uh, group 4 is oral bacteriostatic second line anti tb medicines and group 5 is a group of uh, agents which have unclear efficacy but then if you have to use it you can just use and mix and match from these groups uh the thing is that you get the drug plan for mdr treatment right and then only start this patients on ideally you should let your infectious disease specialist manage the medical aspect of tuberculosis because you are surgeons your knowledge is limited uh, but if you have to then you follow these 10 commandments and you won't burn your hands uh, thank you so much for a pa patient hearing uh, <clears throat> thank you priyank that was uh, excellent uh, you have almost covered many important aspect of uh, tuberculosis uh, in your talk and uh, yeah. thank you for uh, covering most of this uh, in your talk so to summarize what uh, priyank has uh, focused on is uh, tb biopsy is always must on on day one presentation even whatever uh, classical appearance uh, it might be showing on mri conservative is the main line of uh, treatment with anti tuberculosis therapy okay it has to be go go as per the standard protocol as per the way repeat biopsy when it is we have we are in doubt or patient is not responding or worsening give anti to
there is some disturbance there is some disturbance in the network i think i think dheeraj is just trying to summarize and uh, as rightly said uh, a wonderful topic and uh, talk by dr priyank and it is covered most of the things which uh, we as a uh, uh, spine or orthopedic sp uh, specialist want to understand and one thing is important that we need to understand the government policies for the uh, tb uh, nowadays because we have to always report it uh, to the said office and uh, this is very very important and mandatory nowadays in everyone's practice uh, so on that note uh, i would like to thank all uh, the esteemed faculty all the uh, viewers and uh, most importantly uh, professor ajit chinde sir and the west zone for this academic feast uh, in diwali uh, as uh, this is uh, dr chinde's dream uh, to strive uh, through academic and uh, do the simple things first what he always feels and when we always discuss he says ki we all uh, talk about surgeries in the meetings why not 90% patients don't need operations why not we should focus on aspects which are important in our practice and that was the theme for this west zone ioa uh, webinar and i especially would like to thank the west zone for this initiative um, uh yes uh, shinde sir uh, you would like to say anything i would like to thank once again to everyone and wish you a happy diwali thank you sir it was a wonderful show i thank all the participant and really it is a fruitful discussion thanks thank you thank you everyone and uh, celebrate everyone. Uh, happy diwali everyone you and me Your match is also the one. Yeah, yeah. So Virat Kohli. Happy Diwali, is, sir. Uh, yeah, Virat is giving us the gift of Diwali, the first yes. match of the World Cup. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. So we are meeting next Sunday. Yes. Hello, Philip. Hello. Hello.